Today on Not Sam Wrestling, I am sitting down with Mick Foley where the conversation quickly goes from deleting Twitter to female singer-songwriters to angry faxes to the WWE office. We're going over evolution. We're talking about the return of Shawn Michaels. Katie Linendahl is back and more. This is Not Sam Wrestling. This is Not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host, from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Did y'all see my dude love Halloween costume on Instagram? That wasn't from this year. That was from when dude love was a thing. 97, Halloween 97 probably. Welcome to Not Sam Wrestling. That was my special uh, hint. My special hint as to who today's guest would be, Mick Foley. Mick Foley, one of the early guests on Not Sam Wrestling, is back today. We got a lot to go over. We touch on his time as general manager. We talk about his return and how he's a completely different... I mean, he came across as a different person, in my opinion. We talk about his uh, Twitter deletion. By the way, the House Hardy special... The Halloween special on the, on the WWE Network? Magical. Absolutely magical. Some might say, wonderful! I was at Ringside Collectibles Ringside Fest over the weekend doing interviews. The interviews are all popping up on the Ringside Collectibles YouTube channel. I talked to the Undisputed Era, I talked to Matt Hardy, and I talked to Kurt Angle. All for Ringside Collectibles. And I did uh, a Q&A with Bill McKenna, who was also a bonus episode of this here podcast over the week. A lot of content coming from yours truly this week. On top of the ringside collectible stuff, there was the Bill McKenna bonus podcast, which went out to all subscribers, Patreon and non-Patreon, as well as went up on YouTube. So if you want to get a preview of Mattel's Elite 65 and get in to the geeky world, of wrestling figure figure collecting. And I say geeky not as a as an insult, but to say we go inside. It's not a, a surface level conversation about wrestling figures of past and present. It's in depth talking to the head WWE elite designer for Mattel right now, Bill McKenna. That went down, I think that went up on Saturday morning. So the audio went out to all subscribers and the video is up on YouTube. So you can check that out. Also, we did a live preview show video live video preview show for evolution that went up for the not sam shills that are hall of fame and superstar level it is of course still available for hall of fame and superstar uh, yeah hall of fame and superstar level not sam shills over at patreon.com slash not sam wrestling by the way keep an eye on that thing because i'm thinking about uh cutting off one of the levels of involvement on uh, on patreon.com slash not Sam wrestling so that everybody who's paying will get more for the amount of money. I just I, I, I there's something in me that just wants to give everything away. I don't know what it is. I mean the the Patreon is necessary to keeping the podcast alive. Like all the money that the Patreon brings in just goes right back to uh, technology to uh, whether it's studio upgrades, whether it's traveling to get interviews, whether it's whatever mobile equipment, whether it's server space, whatever it is. This is a completely independently funded run podcast. I do it in my studio, which is in my residence. I edit it myself. I do everything myself. So, you know, I book myself. I do everything myself. So that's what we need to keep this thing alive. So the Patreon is key. Patreon.com slash not Sam Wrestling, but I am thinking of restructuring it a little bit so that everybody gets a little more for the dollars that they put in. But of course, if you want to be a superstar or a Hall of Fame level not Sam show, you can go on and catch the video pre show live that I did for Evolution. And we'll talk about Evolution in the state of wrestling. By the way, Katie Linendahl is back for the state of wrestling this week. That's right. After a long absence, uh, lots of requests for Katie Linendahl to return. She is back this week. Katie Linendahl joins me on the State of Wrestling. It's a huge podcast. And before we get to any of it, we got to talk to our guest this week, and that's Mick Foley. Now, this uh, interview was obviously taped before Evolution, uh, and we talked about um, 
the Twitter deletion. I think Mick Foley is now back on Twitter, but, and we also talk about Becky Lynch calling herself the man. This interview was actually taped before my interview with Becky Lynch that aired last week. So now we all know she's called the man. I would, you know, Mick was early on the trend and I went, is she calling herself the man? Obviously I know now, but at the time of this recording, it was a different story. But Mick deleted his Twitter, which I didn't even realize. Uh, it's back now, I believe. But for a while, it was deleted. So we talk about that. We go deep into female singer-songwriters, which probably some of you guys are going to love and some of you guys are going to be like, what are we talking about this for? But we do get a lot of insight. Mick talks about his physical change and why he appeared to be completely refreshed and a different Mick Foley when he showed up on Raw recently. Uh, we talk about, um, uh, 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 I just had it in my head and I completely blanked out because I was getting something ready that I'm going to throw to. You see what I mean? Independently funded. We talk about when he's gotten frustrated with WWE and the faxes that he sent over. We talk about the work he's done on his handwriting. We've got a lot to break down with Mick Foley and we do it all here on the podcast. Here he is. Why wait any longer this week on Not Sam Wrestling? It's my pal. The hardcore legend, Cactus Jack, Dude Love, Mankind, Mrs. Foley's baby boy, the general manager, the commissioner. Here he is, Mick Foley. The Not Sam Wrestling Interview. It's WWE night at the New Jersey Devils here in Newark. And the man himself, the legend, the hardcore legend. I feel like you've moved beyond just being the hardcore legend into just the legend. Mick really? Foley is here. I think, I, so. I think you got to specify. You still, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're like in places like Australia, where like you're a legend, mate. Right. And then you, then someone holds the door for someone. They go, you're a legend. So they throw the word around a little too oh, so liberally. Like I like the, the specification. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. It doesn't separate you from other legends as much as it puts you in a different class. Exactly. I yes. Well, Mick Foley, you're here, and I'm glad you're here because I was gonna. I, w I was hoping that I would talk to you in a public place first because I was gonna just shoot you something privately. But uh -oh. man, the Hell in a Cell comeback, the Raw into oh, the yeah, Hell in yeah. a Cell. Like, I've known you for a long time. It was a different Mick Foley. Why is that? The kid, I, I just thought you were. I was, I was moving a little better, right? You were moving awesome. You were. I mean, your promo was on fire. Like it was like. Mick Foley from, he just had this fire in you, right? Thank that you. That I hadn't, I don't know if I'd seen it in a while, it was just like, it was exciting, right? Yeah. Mick Foley was back for uh, sure. Uh, two things about that, um, uh, Elias was awesome, because you're talking about a kind of a conduit who wasn't even involved in the match, but his character is so strong that I was able to <laughs> kind of segue from him and his singing to building up a match and making that uh, referee position as important as possible. Yeah. Let's just disregard the fact that I did count to three at one point in the match. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. It's almost, that's a skill, man. <laughs> Roman kicking the last second, it was like there was so much speed going down that I couldn't stop it. I was like, I just ruined the match. I just ruined the match. But I did come back with a, you know, like I had an intent and a purpose, and that's the reason why, you know, many months earlier I had, uh, I had turned down the... Um, invitation to be back on uh, raw 25 because i just thought let me come back when it's got some substance to it yeah. and uh and so i'm glad I, i'm glad i did and i'm glad you enjoyed it i did and what i mean what have you physically what have the transformations that you've gone through because i mean to me there was a noticeable difference and i felt like really good about it yeah yeah i um you know i were <laughs> I, I did i worked the rehabs hard uh, last year on the hip and the knee mm -hmm. and um you know, I had a, a one of the knee ligaments is a little a little uh, weak, so I had a knee brace on just to make sure a like, bad boy wouldn't pop out of me. And uh, I felt really good. Like I couldn't move like that a couple years ago. Even when I lost the weight before I had the hip and knee done, like I definitely needed ropes to <laughs> to <laughs> to get into a standing position. So I, I felt a lot better. I felt like I did not hold the match back. Uh, and I just, I was showing off for Becky Lynch. I was like, Lynch, as we were going down the stairs, and I ran down a flight of stairs, oh which I never could have done. And then on the next flight, I said, this is what I would have been like three years ago. I'm literally like holding on for my life, you know, one small step followed by another small step. So, and I'm, a, I'm not talking about a small step for mankind either. <laughs> I'm just talking about small steps for Fine. McFoley. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so did you, 
when you first lost the weight and realized that you needed to do do more than that because the physical stuff yeah. is still there, is that like a frustrating thing? Because you do all this work to lose the weight and you're like, I still like these surgeries. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it uh, reminded me that, um, yeah, I'd really worked those joints <laughs> past their <laughs> expiration date. And it was a little frustrating. I would be the, the GM. And I should have just walked up the stairs, but I had that little, like, hop skip and a jump approach you know it wasn't the most glamorous of uh entrances but i would try to do it and then i would just be hurting so badly for hours afterward like i couldn't even go out to eat with people i'm like i'm sorry i have to go back to my room and i was miserable like i'd be on my, the flight and i would every single time i get there i'd put a water bottle underneath my hamstring and i would roll it you know to try to hit the nerves a little bit yeah it was uh, it was pretty agonizing not to overplay and overstate it but i, I will go with agonizing yeah final it, answer <laughs> agonizing pain and um it was such a relief you know to have the hip and then the knee when the knee really kicked in it took a while longer but uh, i'm doing a lot better than i was yeah i mean it sounds agonizing i think that that is a it sounds like it's an appropriate term so did you know when that stuff starts kicking in did you 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 kind of have to know that this general manager thing it's not going to be something that you're going to do forever. Well, I, d I definitely needed uh, some weeks off. And yeah. uh, in the interim period, let's just say Mr. McMahon found a shinier toy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I would no longer need it in that spot. But it's it's actually, I've I had a great run, eight months. Yeah. And the only thing you can uh, ask for is a good send-off. It's like if you were on a soap opera, instead of being killed off, you get fired. And I had a glorious firing by Stephanie McMahon. <laughs> it really was the week before when I, you know, when I had the face-to-face -face confrontation with Stephanie and Triple H was one of the best moments I've had, you know, in yeah. the last ten years in the business. And uh, I just, I was like, I had that post-pay-per-view rush like I hadn't had in a very long time. So yeah, that's all I can ask for. Uh, you know, um, it was a it was a tough, tough job. And the strangest thing about it, Sam. Mm -hmm was the unpar I won't say unparalleled, I'll say unparalleled in my experience of uh, like negativity coming from the fan base on social media who apparently thought WWE really allowed a 53-year-old man with a fanny pack to run a billion-dollar corporation. So and they were upset <laughs> that you were not doing a good job. Of yeah, running. yeah. Oh, great show! And had real Mick Foley. Like, <laughs> so you, I wasn't giving people breaks they deserved. That was the real downer about. It. I was like, I'm not used to this. Go. Oh, that was no, a I silent think, pause. There, no, a dramatic really, pause. It's an odd thing because like. They're taking it seriously from a character standpoint, but you're a good guy character. <laughs> like, what are they, how, how can... Well, you know, it's, uh, I'd say, you know, most, most people enjoy the show on its own merits, but we do, and we appreciate people who go out of their way to uh, comment on it, but most of the comments are going to be negative. You know, you very rarely, do, just a great show all the way around, no room for improvement, they got it right this time. And, uh, you know, I did have some say in certain instances, and part of that job is learning uh, which battles to fight and why. And there were times when I would just talk to Mr. McMahon and say, I'd really like to handle this one on my own. I have some words, and I think how I say them is more important than what I say. And so if I, last six, if I left six or seven lasting impressions – over the course of eight months, I think that's a, that's a pretty good track record. Yeah, that's almost one a month. That's pretty That's good. not bad, right? Especially yeah. Especially weeks off and everything. That's, pretty, that's not bad. That's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> Did you, so what do you do then? What, what's the strategy? When you realize that this is kind of what the culture has become, do you just not look at at mentions after Raw? Do you condition yourself to take it with a grain of salt? Yeah, that was part. That was part of it. I stopped looking as much, and then I also started trying to contribute uh, verbally uh, by writing out ideas instead of pitching ideas because the mm. game has changed. And uh, if I wanted to have more say, I had to go about it in the newfangled way, which is uh, writing it down and submitting it. And so, if people saw like, uh, if they felt like the last six weeks or so of my time period there was more intense, I think it had something to do with taking a. Uh, uh, you know, a firmer stance and taking a more central role. Yeah. And then, is that because you also knew that you were winding down and wanted to end strong? Yeah. Yeah, that was part of it. I would have liked to have had the WrestleMania payoff to go along with it, you know? I would have liked to have been fired at uh, Nassau Coliseum the week after Mania. But all in all, I was, uh, I was happy with the way I, I left. Uh, I really enjoyed working with Stephanie 
I think uh, she's great. She backed me up so many times when my short-term memory was <laughs> giving me issues. <laughs> she always, always had my back, and I, I don't think people realize how important that is when you zone out 10 seconds into a five-minute interview, when you go, so it's great to be here. Right here. <laughs> and you forget the name of the town, and then you have no idea what you're supposed to do. And then Stephanie would be there with a couple helpful words to get me back on track. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, there is some big news. Please, uh, big news. It's, to me, it's like an Austin 316 moment, all right? Becky Lynch yeah. is hashtag the man. Why do you, why is that, why do you say that? Uh, she just came up with the phrase... And it hashtag struck the man? The man. Just, I'm the man. She didn't say hashtag. I uh -huh. said, you got to hashtag that everywhere you go. You are now the man. I think that's great. I'm the man. It's yeah. like it throws gender on its head. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think that uh, women will gladly say Becky, Becky Lynch is the man. I think men will gladly say she's the man. Like it, it's a bigger that. statement than it's not a, it's not a. I just somehow makes perfect sense. Becky's the one person that fits that. Yeah, the, she the fits Becky, that. She's the yeah. man. She can go out there and say, I'm the man. And I believe people will, will jump on board. I'm already on board. I mean, really? I I probably have something of my own I could push, like uh, appearances coming up, the Jericho Cruise, whatnot. Mm -hmm. I would rather tell people that Becky Lynch is hashtag the man. Because you believe in this. I so do. Much. I believe wholeheartedly she's the man. So... I tried. It was so frustrating as they, no, before they played the anthem. All right. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, paying complete attention. I was trying to get a Facebook post out because I d deleted my Twitter account in a very, in a mature move. Yeah. It was wait, mature. Wait, okay. All right. So let's get back. <laughs> I think this goes back to the conversation of how do we deal with things uh, from feedback. So you deleted Twitter? Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, I was having a bad day, uh -huh. and I had a bag of potato chips, uh -huh. and I realized that uh, I had a Twitter addiction, and I was going cold turkey. When I come back, maybe I can use it more responsibly. And did you delete the account <laughs> or just the app? <laughs> oh, I deleted the app two years ago. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So anytime I lost, it, it cut down on my 99% on the impulse tweets. Right. I see. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm. I'm. Cr I was like, oh man, I may come out of Twitter retirement just to tweet that Becky Lynch is the man. <laughs> I may do that right after. Right, right after we finish here. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Do you ever marvel at uh, the evolution of Mick Foley? That you went from a guy who is writing a 500-page best-selling memoir on notepads to a guy that's like. You know what? I'm gonna delete my Twitter account because I may have an addiction to, to posting. And yeah, I hate that part of myself. You know, you don't like. No, me. I don't. I like. And that Becky is another. She, I said, I said Becky. You know, when, when I love myself, mm -hmm. that's a catchphrase right there. Mm -hmm. And so Becky does love herself. Right now, I'm ashamed of myself that I no longer write books by hand. You are. Yeah, I caved into technology. <laughs> so you would have liked yeah. to when you're submitting storyline ideas. You would have liked to. Have, uh, we know this is a Foley idea. I loved it. it. Yeah, yeah. It, it was even one time when I when I was really angry at the company. Mm -hmm. I wrote like eight handwritten pages and faxed it to the company, <laughs> and so everyone was like, "Whoa, you know what Mick Foley feels? <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't email it. I he had to fax that. over eight angry, hastily written things." And that's when we know it's yeah. real, Mick. Foley. And now, but now the irony of all that, Sam, yeah. is that. Um, while the world, oh, I don't have my pen. Uh, have you have you seen the Foley handwriting? Uh, no, we're oh in my. an office though. There's got to be a pen around. Uh, there. I'm gonna have to show you. You're gonna have to speak. Or you're gonna. Okay, no, you can look it up and and find it. Nita Strauss thought that I had hired somebody to do this when I wrote her a thank you letter because it's so good. It was pretty good. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll imagine. let you be the judge here. Okay. I would love to see. This it. is what one does when one has knee surgery, hip surgery, and wants to make a difference in the world. They do calligraphy? They work on their handwriting until it looks just like Santa's. Let's see. Oh, you wrote this. I wrote that bad boy, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Let me, can you get that? Yeah, look it's at that. Like, it's like an illustrator. Dude. It is, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty nice. It is really something. And then uh, the other one, this was... Um, and did I you could, do that specifically for Christmas, like for Santa stuff? Yeah, like, and this is a like two-page 11 by 17 letter to oh. Jewel, the singer. So we can't it's, get a close-up there. That's very personal. Right. Very personal it's, it's stuff. It's about the, the handwriting, not the words <laughs> that were used. So Jewel got a two-page handwriting. As for handwriting. me, my friend, I love, I love cookies. 
absolutely love them. So don't forget to leave a few out. Gingerbread, oatmeal, and snickerdoodles are my favorite. They're delicious. <laughs> you would the whole it's this kind of thing because we talked about before your Santa addiction starting when thing when you were doing like brutal violent things. Yeah, and yeah. this would be your escape. Right. There's so much less brutal violence in your life. Right. But way more Santa. Than way more. Before. Because there's, yeah, because the world at large is a crazier place, right? Is that what yeah. it is? You turn on the news for five seconds. Oh, like, yeah, okay. yeah. So my dad used to love reading newspapers, mm -hmm. and I love uh, writing letters. Yeah, that's you the truth. What? Writing letters at this point in 2018, just simply writing letters like Santa Claus is probably so much better for your mental health. Very therapeutic. Than sitting there and reading newspapers. And I think my daughter has footage uh, when I met Jewel and uh, and then I told her how much the song Hands meant to me. And she introduced it said, I was just talking to my new friend Mick about this. And I broke down and started crying in the audience. My daughter has me go, and she's singing, In the end, only kindness matters. And I'm, oh, God. <laughs> the hardcore life was oh, oh, man, like a baby. Oh, like no. a baby, yeah. Well, can you rank, and this is going to be a tough question, because, but can you rank Tori Amos? <laughs> oh, don't do this to me. Nora Jones. Oh, God, yeah. And Jewel. Oh, man. That's you guys. Because these are women that not only have impacted your life that they're singing, but you've gotten to know on a personal level. All have impacted profound your life. effects. I've got the singer songwriter weakness, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's tough to, because I was uh, uh, Nora's first uh, first representative for her. Uh, you know, her son was right. a baby. You know, right. and at seven months in the womb, we had a photo as Santa. So, um, uh, but oh, man. Uh, you can't leave Tori. This is crazy because none of your listeners care about any of these three women, right? <laughs> no, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something I relate to. And most of my listeners don't know this about me either, but my wife is like befuddled by it because she just recently found out that I have a similar weakness for female song singer-songwriters. Like, nobody knows the amount of time that I spend listening to Amy Mann. Oh, I love Amy Mann. I love, oh, man. I love. Uh, highly Amy. underrated. Uh, unbelievable. Like, when I sit there and, like, when you look at, like, my spot, Spotify yeah, plays. yeah. Amy Mann's at the top, and I have been on, and this is a real like late '90s one. I've been on this Michelle Branch kick lately. Really? That like I can't explain. Uh, okay, okay. But uh, it's the same thing. It's the female singer songwriter. They reach that sensitive part in our souls, I believe. Uh, so I, I don't know if I've ever talked publicly about Amy Mann being a favorite. I had probably have seven or eight of her CDs. You do. And what was the soundtrack she did? Magnolia. Oh man. Amazing. I can listen to some of those songs like four or five times in a row. Momentum? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, that's what turned me on to Amy Mann, which I loved the movie so much. Make but what's the one that starts? There's a line, now that I've met you, would you object to never, never see me again? again. That's, uh, now that I've met you. Definite you airplay? Play? No, I uh, never... Because uh, I'm not going to come aboard and I, I can do the whole. <laughs> it's, it's nicer than Sam's making it out to yeah, be. But that, um, if she's listening, that's a magnificent song. That's probably stuff, my, yeah. I've got troubles enough. So don't, <laughs> uh, def, We're definitely, definitely, uh, definitely. That's it. Okay. Definitely, We're definitely. losing everyone here. But we figured out. Uh, it I couldn't have gone home because I would have been in the car and I go <laughs> definitely. Oh, Mick needs to know that I know I'm not some Amy Man phony. Um, well, Mick, uh, I'm I, I feel like we've after knowing each other as long as we have, we've we've touched some new ground here. I didn't know we had Amy Mann in, in common. Neither did I. That's... I didn't know uh, the Jewel thing is relatively new. Uh huh. But I'll uh, occasionally get a. Uh, I just met her last year. Uh, you had a, you had a fondness for her before you just met her, or was it is it all new? <laughs> no, I I definitely enjoyed her as a performer, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's funny how the ones you know the one song connected with me so strongly. Not that I don't enjoy a lot of her songs. And then you go into that that like period where you start re listening to everything. And I got to admit, like every eighteen months, as a guilty pleasure, I would like Google the the video for her dance video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Intuition. Intuition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great song. She's got like the head. Oh well, man, and yeah, she looks yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, every eighteen months or so, I like I need to hear that song. I need to watch that song, yeah. uh, not just hear it. Your but kids I, know to leave. You <laughs> Uh, dad's, dad's watching the intuition video again. He needs, he's in his happy place. He needs to be left alone. Uh, and I really, identi you know what, I ident identified with, uh, and this is something, I think the great books or works of art are something that people across different spectrums can identify with. And she had this story uh, about uh, 
singing as a support act for Bob Dylan. And she was told by Dylan's manager, you won't talk to Dylan. You won't see Dylan. He won't see your show. And then about three days into the tour, she sees him hanging out, like watching the show and then requested like an audience. And he wanted to know about her songwriting. And it turned into a really nice friendship to the point where he actually asked her to come out. Very uh, Star is Born-esque, which yeah. is a, a magnificent movie, by the way. And that he brought her out and she thought she was going to go into the background. He's like, no, she shared the spotlight with Bob. And it was really, uh, uh, you know, like a kind of a, you know, an incredible moment for her career and something that I really, you know, registered with me, having been given that chance by a couple of guys, you know, who were big, big in the business at the time. Uh-huh. Well, Mick, uh, is it, are there any thoughts in your head about doing anything else? I feel like, you know, to say... What are you going to do next year? I feel like you were just there for Hell in a Cell, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love doing the, I, I love the tour, the yeah, the Hell in a Cell tour. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And then I had about five shows that I did after the um, the uh, uh, the WWE aired um, uh, Twenty Years of Hell on the network. Yeah, and so that was really challenging to try to come up with stuff that was a little bit different, you mm-hmm. know, not so different. That was an entirely different show. Um, but it was fun. It was really a lot of fun to find different ways to connect with audiences those five days and for those five shows. And I really look forward to coming back, you know, and doing those live shows again in a couple of years. Well, keep up with Mick Foley's appearances. Keep up with his live show. Watch the network special. You got two network, network specials special, now. yeah. Watch and never, one. ever forget that Becky Lynch is the man. Love it. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, Sam. If you guys know anything about me, it's that I love going to see things But I hate complication. I don't mind leaving my house as long as it's not going to be a bother. However, it gets in the way a lot of times. Because what happens is the ticket buying process becomes so overly complicated and ridiculous that I go, oh, forget it. And I end up missing my favorite things. Well, I never have to anymore. And it's all because of my friends at SeatGeek. SeatGeek is one of the most wonderful supporters of Not Sam Wrestling. Not only do they make it possible for us to do this show, but they make it possible for us to see some of the best stuff uh, on Broadway. Comedy shows, sports games, wrestling shows, concerts. Whatever you want to see, SeatGeek has it all. They search multiple ticket sites and they grade every ticket based on value. Yes, it's going to fit your budget and identify the best seats available. Look, I've got it on my phone. It is so easy to use. You click the thing. It tells you what's around you. I don't even need to keep up with who's on tour. SeatGeek app tells me. Then I click it. It shows me the seating map. It says where the seats are. It color codes the seats so I know if it's a good value or if it's a high price or whatever it is. So I can make my choice and I can do it my way. It's the best way to get tickets. It really is. To whatever you're getting tickets to. If you're not using SeatGeek, you're a fool. And I don't want to hear your complaints, quite frankly, because I'm telling you now how to get it done properly. Best of all, you guys, the listeners to Not Sam Wrestling, are getting $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. That's right. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code SAM today. That's promo code SAM, S-A-M, on your SeatGeek app and you're going to get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Do it. Do it now. SeatGeek. Life's an event. We have the tickets. Here is Sam Roberts. Hardcore legend Mick Foley. What a gem, huh? What a gem. Now, I think he is back on Twitter since we recorded the interview. But isn't that crazy? Even mean tweets even get to the hardcore legend. I don't understand why anybody does it. You know, I've never hated something enough to just send rotten tweets to a person. It just Mick, he takes his cell phone out of his fanny pack. Oh, there's people on Twitter, you know, talking about something that I did. Why would you say something mean? Why would you want to upset jolly old Saint Mick? It's just not right. It's just not right. Now, Mick is a great friend. I've known him for quite some time. He was one of the very early guests on the podcast. And uh, I do want to talk about some friends that have some stuff going on. First of all, Kathy Kelly uh, just debuted a a brand new online show on the WWE's YouTube channel um, called Talking Snack. You remember Talking Smack? Well, now she's got Talking Snack, where it's like a cooking show slash interview show 
where you get to you get to see a lot more of Kathy's personality and uh, and and she'll talk to the uh, superstars of the WWE and make fun dishes and stuff like that. It's just a fun show. But the reason that I bring it up is because uh, I remember having conversations with Kathy before she was even in WWE, when she just wanted to be there. Because trust me, when I we had mul- she this is where she wanted to be always. As long as I well, maybe I didn't know her when she was a little girl, but this is where she wanted to be. And one of the things that she wanted to do was this cooking show. So to see it come to fruition is an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, it's it's inspiring and it's joyful and it's it's just amazing. So go out there and support Kathy Kelly's uh, cooking show, Snack, Talking Snack, because uh, this is a. This is the girlhood dream finally coming true. And speaking of dreams, uh, you know, Joey Janela, another friend of the podcast, he is unfortunately injured, but he's going ahead with the shows that he promotes, his his name-branded shows. And the one in April is Joey Janela's Spring Break 3. Tickets went on sale this week. He announced over the weekend that he was getting Onita, which to me, I mean, I my... Obsession with Onita is, I think, really weird to a lot of people because I don't talk about Japanese wrestling like that that much. But when I was in high school, I was like a huge tape trader. I had thousands and thousands of tapes, and I was in high school in the late 90s, early 2000s. So one of the big things for me was the Explosion Deathmatch tapes. I had all of them. It started with the IWA, the, the IWA Japan Deathmatch Tournament that, of course, the finals were Cactus Jack and Terry Funk from 1995. But then as you started exploring that world and seeing there were promotions like Wing and FMW and all these spots that were doing all these death matches with uh, uh, Onita and Mr. Pogo and uh, Gladiator, Mike Awesome, and Leatherface and Jason the Terrible and the Keeper Crypt or whatever they you know they changed the Crypt Keeper to whatever and Freddy Krueger and I, I just I and Cactus Jack was there and I just Masato Tanaka was the deathmatch guy I loved all of it the big Japan stuff piranha deathmatches scorpion deathmatches cactus deathmatches exploding ring matches exploding beds of barbed wire I would for when I with my figures I would get like a, a, a piece of wood, right? Like a small piece of wood to just be like a bed, like figure size, like six inches by four inches or whatever. And I would like un- straighten out paper clips and cut them and then twist them back together. So it would make like a bar, like make like barbed wire. That's how I would connect it. And I make a bed of barbed wire. And then I take those poppers you know, those like paper poppers that you used to be able to get in the 99 cent store. You get a box of them and you just throw them at the ground and they pop like crazy. I would get those and I would tape like half a dozen of them to the piece of wood that had all that fake barbed wire on it. That way I could throw like my Cactus Jack figure onto it and it would do the effect of the exploding barbed wire board. I would do all that stuff. I loved all the deathmatch stuff and I loved everything Onita did. Uh, Onita, the great Nita, all of it. I just thought it was great. Thought it was great. And CZW brought in Onita... Uh, I want to say a year ago in August, I guess it could have, no, I think it was a year, yeah, it was a year ago in August, so it was like, whatever, 14 months ago, CZW brought Onita to the States for the first time since like 1991 or something like that, and I drove all the way out, I bought a ticket, I waited online for the meet and greet, and I got to meet Onita, uh, and when I found out that Joey Janela had booked Onita on this show. I was excited all over again. I got my my copy of RF Videos, Best of the Explosion Deathmatch Volume 3. I got Onita to sign that. And when Joey Janela announced this, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to print out my photo with Onita. And get, I'm going to have a signed photo with Onita. This is going to be great. And I'm going to get to see him do all kinds of explosion stuff. Joey Janela's so, show sold out in like a half hour. It's done. The tickets are done. So congratulations to Joey Janela. And I'm telling you right now, you got to get me into that spring break show. I got to see Onita. And matter of fact, it's so funny. If you have that CZW tape or whatever it is, like if you you have home video of that CZW show that Onita was on, you can see me. I'm in like the third row. I'm on the entranceway. uh, I'm all over that thing. 
So uh, I'm so excited that Onita is going to be there, and I'm so happy that Joey Janela was able to sell out his show. We move on to even more friends. We have a very special state of wrestling this week as we recap Evolution uh, in a big, big way. Uh, we talk about Shawn Michaels' return. We got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. But I said, if we're going to recap Evolution, I need to get me a strong female in here. If we're going to recap Evolution, I need to get some uh, the female point of view, and I need to get one of the strongest ladies that I know, smartest ladies that I know. Who am I going to get? Well, I think we all know that. I put out the call, and it was responded to. Katie Linendahl makes her return to the state of wrestling, the moment you've been waiting for right now. It's now time for this week's State, state of wrestling. wrestling. So here we are. It's State of Wrestling time again here on Not Sam Wrestling, and this is, this is a special State of Wrestling. This is a State of Wrestling that's been asked for for well over a year. I don't know exactly uh, how long, but a long time. Long enough that it was time it finally answered. And we've talked about doing this probably like 15 times in the last year. It's just a matter of hammering down like, when? Well, we'll do it then. We'll do it then. We're doing it today. It's happening right now. Ladies and gentlemen, back on the podcast. Back in the state of wrestling, the legendary Katie Linendahl. Welcome back. <laughs> there it is. That's the call yes. that everybody's been waiting for. I am happy to be back. Oh, my goodness. I can't, it really, it's been a year? Are you kidding me? I think it's been more than a year. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and people were like, oh, what happened? And I, I mean, I've told people when you, at some point, when you live life the way you do and the way that I do, <laughs> like a year just goes by. It goes from like, yeah, we'll do this every week to, okay, we'll do it next week. And then it's been 18 months and we're like, oh, wait, 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 wait. We were supposed to do it that one week. Totally. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm glad you're back. I was happy to see this week, of course, Halloween week, a big week for you. You had the Sting costume. You got the big yeah. Stephanie McMahon tweet. Uh, big things, big things. Big things. It was it was a little dicey, you know, walking around New York City with a baseball bat <laughs> as Sting. Yeah. A little controversial. I don't know how I got past security at CBS Radio, but I did. Ah, it's okay. You're, it you're, was a strong performance. Your face was covered in paint. That's not suspicious at all. No, no. And then you you, you forget that you're covered in paint. So right. You're like trying to like get an Uber. You're yelling at your Uber because your Uber's yelling at you. And oh. It's just like you're trying to go on with life as normal, and it's not normal. It's not. So it was it a was good time. Right, it was. And that actually does say something about your life, that you would dress up as Sting and just go like, this is life as normal, okay? I got to get to where I'm going. And everybody's like, wait. Well, Sam, you know, Halloween can be an opportunity to hoe it out, and that's not my, I, it's not my M.O. I like to do the weird characters. Yeah, I don't no. Like to go in that direction. I noticed, uh, and I noticed you did that at uh, whatever Comic Con it was, maybe New York Comic Con, when you did Ric Flair. You don't do sexy Sting. You don't do sexy no. Ric Flair. You do true to life. Steve Borden didn't do sexy Sting. Ric Flair didn't do sexy Ric Flair. They just did Sting and Ric Flair, and that's what Katie <laughs> Linendahl does. It's impressive. That's correct. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and I was texting with you uh, while we were watching SmackDown this week. It's not one of the top five stories of the week, but both of us reacting the exact same way when the Broods music starts uh, playing. Oh, my God. Are we going to see Gangrel on SmackDown right now? One word, Gangrel. <laughs> thought it was going down. Thought it was going down. Equally surprising and entertaining. But, yes, you and I were on the same page. Yeah, I really... So I was like, we're not going to get Edge again. He was just there last week or the week before. If Edge isn't there, Christian's not going to be there. But maybe the New Day with Gangrel at their side, I could see it. I could see it. And then, back. yeah, I was, I, I was missing Gangrel. But Big E as Gangrel was also um, strong. Yeah, they were, I think, I think I, I, the name that we settled upon uh, online and everything was first it was the new brood and i was like well the hardys were technically the new brood so new day and brood and then the new drood i was like yeah new drood <laughs> new drood it is instead of like the blood it was like maple syrup you know, they had yeah. like an own twist on it right exactly showing you can still be entertaining in a pg era i like that yeah i like that yeah well let's get into it you know what we do on the state of wrestling it's the top five stories of the week According to yours truly, the last professional broadcaster, Sam Roberts, with some help this week from Katie Linendahl. Uh, and I put this as story number five only because it probably has more to do with the timeline than anything else. It, it's not the least remarkable story. In fact, 
probably for me the most remarkable story, and that is recapping evolution. I know that you were watching, Katie. I saw your tweets about how, you know, you, you recognized what a big, big deal it was. What were your overall impressions of the evolution pay-per-view from conception to execution? I must be, you know, the, the millionth female wrestling fan. I, I've been a female wrestling fan, you know, this my entire life. And I know I'm sounding like a broken record because many people have said this before, but I can't believe that moment happened and we got to that point. And yeah. it's just so, it's so freaking awesome to see what happened in that ring. And I was kind of like a little nervous because I wanted it to be executed so perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to be just, just amazing out the gate. And I think the tone and the mixture of the legends and the current superstars and, and NXT the whole mixture and the whole tone, the way it was set up, it felt very indie. It felt very NXT. I loved it start to finish. I thought there was enough touch of like the fun stuff, the comedy, again, the legends, and also just the freaking intensity of the last man standing match, which I know we'll <sighs> talk about. Every last dose of how it was blended together, I was just like on edge and, and just thrilled with the entire performance. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. You know, there was this risk that if the pay-per-view is just not good, if the matches oh, are not good, right. you know, then every sort of criticism that's ever been laid out about women, you know, that you have one shot at it. And whether it's fair or not fair, if you don't do it right and or it doesn't work for some reason, it's going to get blamed on the women. Even if it's production errors, even if it's whatever, it's going to get blamed on, well, you know, this is why we don't do women's only pay-per-views. But it was a great pay-per-view i mean when you go down and, and you're right in terms of the mixture of what was going on the ronda nikki bella match i think over delivered some people and i think the bellas have this stigma against them which is why it works when they're heels i don't think it's a fair stigma because i think the bellas especially nikki is better than a lot of people give her credit for but i thought that the match with ronda completely delivered and and gave us what was promised and was a really good match and a good main event the last woman standing match completely stole the show and as high as expectations were for that match it defied expectations uh the battle royal was exactly what the battle royal should have been although we can talk about the results and how it went because that was definitely controversial um the the nxt title match was a great title match with the first sort of Big mainstream inclusion of the four horsewomen of MMA with Jessamyn Duke mm -hmm. and Marina Schaefer jumping in. The the May Young Classic Finals delivered. Uh, yeah, I thought it was really, really good too. And you touched on something, which was the feel of NXT, the kind of indie NXT type feel, which on some level, it just depends on how you look at it. Like the, the, the production value-wise, the show was stripped down. I was... Looking at it going, it's really interesting. I don't know if it's good or bad. You know, when I first turn it on, I go, is this good or bad? Let me watch the whole show and figure out how I feel about it. It was the televised house show set for the most part in the mm -hmm. sense that they didn't have the the TV barricades, the walls. They had the old school guardrails with sheets over them. The lighting was very much the house show lighting in the sense that the crowd was blacked out, not lit up in different colors like Raw, SmackDown, or pay-per-views. Uh, obviously, the screens were different. There was no LED uh, corner post. There was no LED apron. And I think that a lot of that might have had to do with the fact that TV was in Charlotte on Monday. So usually the TV and the pay-per-views are really close together because they're on this tour like a, like a concert, right? Like a concert tour. They specifically map out venues so that it makes sense which direction the bus is going. So the idea would be that you can take the stuff from the pay-per-view and move it to the next arena with mm. a 24-hour turnaround for Raw the next night. And maybe because you're ending this pay-per-view at 10.30 and you got to be live at 8 p.m. in Charlotte, North Carolina, there's just not enough time for the trucks to get from New York to North Carolina. I don't know if that was the case or not. I, w I assumed it was when I was watching. I said, that makes sense that they said, here's the issue that we have. And instead of trying to do it half right, we're just going to go all the way with the feel that you said. And you, so you, en you enjoyed that part of it, though. You liked yeah. that it was stripped uh, can down. Can I add something to that, too? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think it was also 
if we're using the word lean and maybe in a different way, but it, seven matches, I think felt right. There was no like, Oh, is this, this is feeling a little long. I feel like it was just the right amount, like pack it in, do it hardcore, do it right. And it almost left you wanting more, yeah, which I think is always the way to do things. That goes back to what you said about takeovers, right? The, the, the takeovers end, and you're like, oh, my God, start to finish. Now, this was longer. Takeovers usually go about two and a half hours. This one went three. It did go three and change. Some people were saying, well, of course, this was a short show, blah, blah, blah. This show was longer than traditional <laughs> pay-per-views have been. Remember, it used to be three hours max for a pay-per-view, but I didn't realize that actually. It felt like it was a more condensed show, but you're right. What if we got to when we're saying three hours is short? Right. It started at, and that's not even counting the kickoff. It started at, the, the show show started at seven and went until like 10, 18 or so. It was way over three hours. Mm. So, you know, it was definitely not, you know, a, a micro show by any stretch of the imagination, but you're right in the sense that had they added more. Fatigue could have sat in, and that would have been uh, uh, deadly, I think, for the show. I, three hours is a good amount of time. Going a little bit over is fine. Uh, I, I, I think when you start approaching four hours is when you go, wow, I've been watching this for a long time, and it takes a lot to keep everybody engaged. But speaking of keeping, keeping everybody engaged, in terms of WWE pay-per-views this year, I don't know if there was a more engaged audience from start to finish than Long Island watching this show. I mean, the crowd was like on fire from the beginning until the end of the show. That was a loud audience. That, and I was watching on television. I wasn't in Long Island. But but that was a loud crowd that was kind of, it felt like they were into everything. Even at the end where I was like, oh, I wouldn't want to follow that match after obviously Charlotte Becky. That's right. a, that was a tough one. They were still pretty hot, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They were not like, I, I didn't think Nikki and Rhonda had any issues with crowd involvement whatsoever. I thought you know, they were ready for it. The, the audience was ready for it. And I think it helps that Nikki Bella and Rhonda Rousey are the biggest stars as far as women go there. You know, you could talk about Charlotte, you could talk about this person, but Rhonda Rousey is an international celebrity without WWE. And the Bellas have gone beyond wrestling with their social media stuff, with their reality show stuff, with their Birdie B stuff. They've become, they've built an entire audience that doesn't even watch wrestling. So I, I think that there was some of that. Like, this is a big match with big names in it. And I think well, to it, me, that felt like that was the celebrity match. Yeah. And I thought that was really well played that you go from Last Man Standing, which just was it unto itself. That was its, its own beast. Mm -hmm. and then you have the celebrity match to kind of culminate it. At first on, on paper, I was like, eh, then it made sense. Right. Each one was so different. Every one of those matches was different. Which is good because it used to be a thing where women's matches were plug and play. You would just throw, mm -hmm. like, here's the spot for the women's match. I don't know. We'll figure out which women are going to go in there. And and this didn't feel like the same thing over and over again at all. You're 100% right. So we started with uh, Trish and Lita versus... Alicia and Mickey James, which is tough, you know, and we talked about that on, on the pre-show that we did for Patreon because the match had been changed so many times. That started as two singles matches. Mm -hmm. Then it became a tag match with uh, 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 Alexa Bliss in it. And then Alexa Bliss gets injured at the last minute and we have to put Alicia Fox in there. Given all of the sort of tornado-like mayhem that was going on around that match as far as getting there and the fact that Trish and Lita have wrestled once and it was at the Royal Rumble in the last decade plus, I think that they were able to, to handle that pretty well. And I think a great way to come out the gate, subjectively speaking, with just, I don't know about you, but I was fired up to see just the, the night start with Trish mm -hmm. and Lillian like, Lillian was a big deal for me. Doing the announcing? Me, yes. I, th yeah. I was just, uh, that, and then obviously Lita coming out. That, that, to me, was just legendary. And just, I think the crowd, it just, it set the tone. And, you know, that's a good point. What I liked about this pay-per-view more than I liked about the representation that the women got at the Royal Rumble was that at the end of this pay-per-view, you got that in the beginning, right? Like, you got the Trish and Lita and Lillian 
in the very beginning of the show. Then towards the middle, you got some legends sprinkled in in the Battle Royal. But at the end of the day, the last however many women in that Battle Royal were current roster stars. Um, And aside from that opening match, the focus was on the current roster of women. In the Royal Rumble, it almost felt like half and half. Like, a lot of the buzz about that all-women's Royal Rumble was seeing 15 of these, or however many, female legends coming back. So it was like, legend, legend, this is exciting. Mm -hmm. And it it was almost 50-50 as far as attention on the current roster women. This show, it was like 85-15, if not 90-10, current roster to legends. And I think that that was a really good move. By the way, as like a quick interjection, how great are the Iconics? They're my favorite people. I mean, they're, they're look, Sasha Banks so is always going to be my favorite funny. wrestler, but the Iconics are amazing. I love the Iconics. I was so happy when they came up to the main roster. Uh, I'm so happy that not only have they not changed their routine, but they've actually, it's bigger. They're like, it's more than it ever was in NXT. I think that, I think they're absolutely incredible. Incredible. They're so entertaining. Hilarious. I don't know how many times I watched that intro. I don't w- w- rack stuff back and watch it again. Mm-hmm. I watched that intro to the ring several times because it was that funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I interviewed them a couple weeks ago for the podcast and I was going, how do you, how do you not get caught up in it? Meaning how do you not flub? How do you not lose confidence? Because if you look in their eyes as they're doing these ridiculous promos, there is never, they never lose confidence in what they're saying. They never lose confidence in themselves and I think it helps that like they're real life best friends like they're real life iconics and so the fact that they have each other supporting each other in real life means that they can perform maybe on a different level than a lot of people um kind of the same thing with the undisputed era is that like the fact that those guys are real life brothers traveling partners whatever you want to say the Iconics are real-life sisters, traveling partners, whatever mm-hmm. you want to say. It makes it kind of easier to perform at a certain level because you have the person next to you who you trust with everything keeping you up at that high level because they're performing there too and making you know that take a risk. It's okay. I'm doing it too. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. Um, so, and, and WWE is so good with their timing. So if you're watching it, they aired the first 30 minutes of this pay-per-view on Twitter as well. So you like people on Twitter could just watch it live. Idea being, you know, you're on Twitter watching the first half hour. It cuts off after a half hour. Let me go subscribe to the WWE network. I hear it's free to new subscribers. And they do. I love, they do this every time. They, if, if they give a little of the pay-per-view away for free, they always cut it off during the entrance of a battle royal. It's a <laughs> formula, and it works every time because you start seeing all these people come down the aisle. And you're like, I got to see this. I just saw Trish and Lita put in 30 minutes. That was amazing. That's from my childhood. Oh, look at all these women coming down. Who's going to win this battle royal? Tune into the network and find out. Oh, I got to tune in. Like I, I <laughs> You get the appetizer, not the entree. Exactly. Sorry, not e- sorry. Exactly. So... <laughs> I was really hoping that Asuka would win this battle royal. I was already, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a little dismayed at the uh, trajectory that Asuka has been on since WrestleMania, uh, just because I'm such a, a huge Asuka fan and supporter. And I was, I was a little surprised that she didn't have a singles match at this show, and there was no real build for anything for her going into this show. But I said, okay, if they're going to put her in the battle royal, the trick is to have her win the battle royal. And then start teasing us with the idea of Becky Lynch versus Asuka. To me, money, 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 money. But, much to my dismay, not only does Asuka get eliminated, she gets eliminated not terribly difficultly, and she's not even in the final two. I don't mind Nia Jax winning, you know, because I think that Nia Jax needs that shot in the arm, like a refresher to remind people that she's a special, special athlete, and... Should we look at Nia Jax? We watch Nia Jax in the ring. This character should be feared by the rest of the women's roster. So I support Nia Jax winning. I just wish it had come down to Asuka and Nia, and this, like, it could go either way right here because Asuka is just as special as opposed to uh, seeing that same back and forth, but between Nia and Ember Moon. 
Yeah, I think Ivory got further. Than Oscar. And I, I, Ivory looks amazing. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, right. But she's you have not, a really great point. Right, right. She's not going for like Ivory. That was one night for Ivory. It's awesome to see Ivory, and it's awesome to see that she's able to pull off what she's still able to pull off. But at the end of the day, we're tuning into SmackDown on Tuesday, and I want to be reminded that Oscar is a phenom, not you know, that Oscar is, eh, pretty good. Do you think it was too fast of a trajectory to push Jax? Uh, no, no, because I think Nia Jax is pretty special. Like, I'm pretty, pretty supportive of of doing what's going on. I think Nia Jax is good for a couple reasons. Number one, you look at her; she looks intimidating. She's bigger than the other women. She looks like she can beat them up, and I want to believe that she can beat them up. Number two. I think she's got a great personality. I like her promos. I like the 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 way she wrestles in the ring. I like the whole thing. So I, I I want her winning as much as possible. And I think that she's a believable champion. I also think, you know, when you're talking about role models, I think Ronda Rousey's a really good role model. But I think Nia Jax is a really good role model too. This thing that they do where they talk about uh, body types being okay. Uh, you know, all different body types being okay. I think Nia Jax is a great face for that because she's like got this atypical body type, but she's gorgeous. So, you know, I think all of that puts Nia Jax as, as far as Raw goes, one of the top women. And honestly, when you look down the Raw roster of women, who can beat Ronda Rousey? Like who realistically can beat Ronda? Maybe Alexa if she uses bad guy tactics and sneaky things, maybe. And, but in terms of like, in a clean match, who can pin Ronda Rousey? The only Charlotte. person... Well, she's not on Raw. I'm talking about just the women on Raw. Oh, you're not talking about paper. Okay. Right, Fair right. Enough. So, because... Totally, totally. But just the women on Raw. I think, to me, Nia Jax is the only one on Raw that at this moment could believably beat Ronda. So... Let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you think that now her more genuine personality that's being kind of played true in the ring. Do you, watching that kind of transition over, I guess it's been years, kind of that bad guy mentality that's more, now it's more like kind of happy Naya, which I think is like genuinely her. I mean, I don't know. Do you like that better? Yeah, I do, because I kind of see what it is. It's not dissimilar from what's going on with Ronda in the sense that some people think that Ronda should be the female Brock Lesnar, but I think that they're doing right by Rhonda. I think that she should be smiling when she comes out because, you know, I think that that Rhonda is there to be a role model. Like, Rhonda is there to teach young girls that if they dedicate themselves to something, whether it's judo or wrestling or whatever else it is in their lives, if they dedicate themselves to something as much as Rhonda has, they can also be this good. When you look at Brock Lesnar... Nobody looks at Brock Lesnar and thinks that, well, if I just try really hard one day, I'll be Brock Lesnar. No, there will, nobody will be Brock Lesnar. He's a freak. He's an animal. He's a beast. He's something totally different. Ronda Rousey is like this next level elite athlete, but it's attainable. And I think that Nia Jax has that same thing. I think that the old school way to approach Nia Jax is definitely monster, unbeatable heel, easy, right? But I think the the new school way of thinking, especially with, with these women, is that Nia Jax really has all the markings to be that role model. And I think that fans like her, you know? So I, I, I don't think that that's, a, that's a, 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 a wave that you should try to fight against. I think you go, okay, like she's got all the qualifications that make her somebody that young girls should look up to. People like her. You know, people are, they get excited when she comes to the ring. So why try to change that? I agree. I yeah. think even maybe in times past, and just my two cents, seeing her come to the ring, she was kind of like hiding the smile a little bit. Right. And now we get the real her that I think she's perhaps wanted to be. And I, I think it's kind of endearing. Yeah. And some people said that uh, Ember Moon needed that way more than Naya. Ember Moon should have won that battle royal and blah, blah, blah. And like... I get the Ember Moon fans. I was there. You know, I watched NXT constantly. So I totally, this isn't to take anything away from Ember Moon. But the reality is, based on the way that Ember Moon has been portrayed on Raw since she got there, I don't, I think that if she had won the Battle Royal, it would be this moment for Ember Moon. 
But then she would go right back to what she was doing before, winning half the time, losing half the time. I don't think that she would have ended up on another level. And inevitably, that would have meant that the whole battle royal was for naught. Like, the result of the battle royal really had no impact on anything. So why do it, you know? So that's why I was okay. I thought Ember Moon having a strong presence in that match was just as good, if not better, than Ember Moon winning the thing. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Um, you had the six-person tag, of course, uh, Natty, Sasha, and Bailey versus the Riot Squad. Uh, again, I think this was a moment for, obviously, you have the good guys winning. But realistically, I think the reason this match was on the show is to show off the Riot Squad. I mean, I think that's Ooh. why, because some people were going, why doesn't Sasha have a singles match? You know, I, st I still wish that they had gone all the way with the Sasha Bailey thing and we could have finally had a Sasha Bailey blow off match at this show, like an ultimate grudge match or something. But the fact that they didn't do that, you know, I think that this was a good opportunity to give Bailey, Sasha and Natty uh, a, a match that wasn't the battle Royal, a match that was all their own. But I think realistically they needed three women to compete against the riot squad because they wanted to use this platform to show the world that we have this team that I think the WWE really believes in. And I think there's a reason for that. You know, I think that I think that the Riot Squad has done exceptionally well since coming onto the main roster. How do you get the Riot Squad bigger, though? I think you, you've just made a point as to one instance, but, like, how, where do you go from here to, to really, I don't know, propel them a little bit more? Well, I think that, you know, the the... the so at the moment, it's a little bit tough because the Bellas are around. And as long as the Bellas are heels, bad guys, they're going to be the number one bad guys. And that's kind of hard to avoid. But I think that eventually, you know, a nice slow burn. And that's why it was okay that the Riot Squad lost. As long as they looked impressive, it reminds us like, oh, yeah, I like when the Riot Squad wrestles. You know, um, I, I think that we can, give it, we can give this one some time. But eventually... I think that because she's part of the Riot Squad, Ruby Riot could easily become like this really sort of fearsome bad guy women's superstar. You know, I think that she could easily become a bad guy challenger for that title that is impossible to beat, not only because she's ruthless, not only because she's really good, but because she's got Liv Morgan and the Viking, Sarah Logan, in her corner. Um, that's probably what I think, like, you know, the inevitability would go is to keep this unit together, almost like a bad guy w ladies new day and, you know, have them be bullies in the locker room, you know, show them on TV being bullies in the locker room, have them be people that don't hang out with anybody else except themselves. And eventually Ruby Riot becomes really tough to beat because she's always got her friends by her side. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was what was in my head. Um, you know, I thought the Mae Young Classic finale delivered. I thought that was really good. Um, and the NXT title match, like I said, I'm happier that the NXT— I love Kaidi Sane, but I'm happier with the NXT title on Shayna Baszler. You know, I was talking about special people, Ronda being special, Nia being special, uh, Asuka being special. Shayna Baszler, like, I'm, so, I'm such a Shayna Baszler fan— I think she's like a classic bad guy. Uh, I think she's believable. I think she's completely taken to pro wrestling like a fish to water, especially WWE pro wrestling like a fish to water. Uh, I think she's going to do amazing things on the main roster when she gets there. But in the meantime, I like her in NXT as an unstoppable force that you can't get the title away from, that we all just want some hero to come and get the title away from, and nobody can do it. And now that she's got uh, Jessamyn Duke and Marina Schaefer by her side, it goes kind of into the Riot Squad formula I was just talking about, where it's like now it's hopeless. She's going to be the champion forever. I like the idea of having a champion that you look at them and you go, well, they're going to be the champion forever. There's no way you're going to be able to get that title off them. And that's what I think you've got with Shayna Baszler. And as you know all too well, seeing some superstars in person is like totally different. And watching her at Full Sail, I, I was down there for tapings 
a couple months ago, j- even more electric I- in the arena. I, I like, wow, that was, yeah. and it's such an intimate environment there, as you know. I, I was like, you speak to something special. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, absolutely. And the NXT audience believes it. You know, the NXT audience believes what she's selling, which is big. Uh, we talked about the main event a little bit, which was uh, Nikki versus Ronda, which, again, I think delivered on all counts. Um, and then I think universally, I don't think that anybody could argue this, but match of the night was clearly the last woman standing match between the man, Becky Lynch, and... And Charlotte, you know, I I just, I said it when we first started talking, but to have expectations be as high as they were for this thing, and to have those two actually defy expectations is unbelievable. Uh, And I think, I think that it really goes to show that the WWE is aware that they have something magic right now with Becky Lynch, because she won that thing inarguably clean. Like she was the last woman standing. There's no arguing it at all. Not many people have gotten that kind of victory over Charlotte and Becky Lynch did it. There's no more questioning who's better. Becky is better. And, and I thought it was amazingly executed and satisfying. And the whole thing was just great. No matter how much people cheer her, I think the confidence she exudes as a villain is yeah. next level. And I think we have these amazing matches that we always talk about, like Sasha Bailey. Mm-hmm. But this was a standalone category of just pure carnage. Yeah. I mean, I'm still sore thinking about that match. That and you, was beyond words. And you don't see that with women. I mean, that and that was the point of the pay-per-view, right? Is to like, And that's the point of what Becky's doing is that Becky's not worried about, like, paving the way for women or, you know, doing things that nobody ever thought women would be able to do. Becky is going in to win matches and to just hurt opponents, you know? I had Becky— I mean, she calls herself the man. The man. It says it all right there. The man. It doesn't matter. None None of this, oh, we're making history tonight. Yeah, I don't care. I don't care. I'm here to beat up Charlotte, and that's it. And that's what I want to see— out of somebody like Becky, you know, that's, I, I want to see somebody step out of that sort of, uh, real, like we're really witnessing a magical moment and having a character like Becky say, I don't care about any magical moment. The only magical moment is when I hold the championship over my head in victory. That's the magical moment. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I'm going to beat all of you. Like that's, that's it. That's it's awesome. And no matter where she goes, you know, I had her on the podcast last week and then she was also on my radio show last week. And it's she's locked into the character. You know, she's Conor McGregor. She's selling fights everywhere that she goes. And it's amazing. Speaking of Becky, I'm going to use that to transition into story number four uh, to me, which is the beginning of the Survivor Series card being built. So we're going back to the one night of the year when Raw and SmackDown compete in head-to-head competition. Uh, I I would imagine that we're going to find out who the new Universal Champion is going to be, and they're going to take on AJ Styles. Uh, We've already, it's it's been made official. Shinsuke Nakamura versus Seth Rollins is going down at Survivor Series, which to me is a total dream match. And say what you want about whether Shinsuke Nakamura has, you know, really hit the mark that we expected him to on the main roster. Having an opponent like Seth Rollins is just amazing. If I told you Shinsuke Nakamura versus Tyler Black was going to be happening years ago, you would have been losing your minds. I'm losing my mind over the potential of that match. But the big match that was announced on Raw is the aforementioned Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey going one-on-one. Now, there were rumors about this match happening and maybe replacing what was a potential Charlotte Ronda match at WrestleMania, that maybe there would be a build to it and, and, and eventually we would get there. But since at Survivor Series, it's champion versus champion across the brands, we're getting there right now, you know, three weeks, boom, we're doing it. Question, Katie Linendahl, do you think we're getting to Ronda Rousey versus Becky Lynch too quickly? Zero to a hundred real fast. I, I almost wanted to just sit and think about last man standing match for a little longer. Mm -hmm. And now we're just revved up to survivor series. It's happening 
really, really fast. And you almost just, I mean, I personally want that story to build a little bit longer. Is it going to be incredible? Of course. And I, sometimes just timing just is timing. Yeah. But it is happening in just a matter of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, this is not to say that we can't revisit this. You know, the context of this match is it's non-title and it's just brand versus brand because it's Survivor Series. Who's to say that sometime between now and then, Becky Lynch won't lose the SmackDown title. She could lose at Survivor Series to Ronda. She could lose the SmackDown Championship in December. She could win the Royal Rumble and then go over to Raw and challenge Ronda Rousey for the Raw Women's Championship at WrestleMania. Mm. Just because it's happening at Survivor Series doesn't mean it's not going to happen with a greater context later on. Like, There's a million ways, I think, that you could do this match without wasting this match, if that makes sense. But there's nothing like it coming out the gate for the first time. No, that's true, but unless you use the first time to be the first building block in a storyline, right? Like you could say, you know, the Samoa Joe, AJ Styles SummerSlam match, it was a disqualification finish. It wasn't the ending that we hoped for. But that match, because it was done well, and because the finish was done well, it helped build to the next one and the next one. It became a building block in this series of matches that actually worked. If we have Ronda beat Becky some way, shape, or form, and then Becky, you know, they part ways for months, Becky remains dominant, and then we find some other context to have them meet again, well, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, you're not going to fool me again. But we don't want it to turn into Nakamura Styles either. Well, that was, yeah, that was a different story. That's when it goes, sad. I mean, that's like, I mean, th who was it? Uh, the the Randy Orton Jinder Mahal series. Like that was not, that, that's when it doesn't work out. When you're having either non-finishes or just rematches and they're not effective, you know, and that can happen too. But I don't think Becky Lynch would allow that to happen. Becky Lynch has perfected the art of her character and perfected the art of storytelling and is just so invested in this whole thing that I don't think I don't think Becky Lynch would allow it to happen and I think us as an audience is so engaged in everything that is Becky Lynch right now I don't think that we would allow it to happen PS did you have that fool me once quote right That was my George W Bush version of it <laughs> <laughs> it's an aftertaste. I just figured it out. <laughs> yeah, so I, I see your point though. Yeah. Coming back to topic at hand. I see your point. Yeah, so I'm 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 of the category like look, I, I have I'm a big Becky Lynch person. So I would have liked you know, and who knows? I mean the first week of build has been great already. The the promos that are firing back and forth, the the social media stuff that's going on, it's been great. So by Survivor Series, we may be frothing at the mouth for this Becky Lynch Ronda Rousey match. But as much as we wish that it was a a, a bigger deal, I think number one, it'd be weird not to do it if it's champion versus champion for every other category. And number two, I think this does not mean that we cannot visit it again. And so I think that's something that people should uh, keep in mind. Uh, we move on to story number three, which is, uh, and this is one I was anxious to talk to you about, um, because we've talked about stuff in the past about things that reach into storylines where I think it's okay and you don't think it's okay. You think it goes beyond the scope of wrestling, and I think there's only a small handful of things that go beyond the scope of wrestling, especially if all the performers are involved. There, The conversation that's going on now is with Dean Ambrose mm. and Seth Rollins. So the Dean Ambrose turn happened the night, one of the most emotional Monday Night Raws ever. Like, just as awful as it gets, Roman Reigns announces that he has to step away because, you know, he's had leukemia for 11 years. It was in remission. It's back. He's got to go take care of it, and I mean, you know, just dropped everybody. Crushing. Crushed. Crushing, Crushing is the right word. Ugh. At the end of that show, Dean Ambrose turns on Seth Rollins, which, to me, 
was gorgeous. I mean, I just, I just absolutely loved that. That's the moment they chose. Figures. Yeah, I thought that that I thought that was the only way that you can actually make Dean Ambrose a heel because people like him so much. I was like, yeah, and you know, I I liked that we were getting back to wrestling. They went a step further this week on Raw and kind of continued to play on the fact with Seth Rollins saying stuff about the fact that Dean Ambrose used that moment that was the most emotional moment to turn on him and blah, blah, blah. So the Roman Reigns story, as much as it is a real-life serious moment, is also being incorporated into a storyline between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. What do you think of that? I, I think it went deeper behind the scenes to, to ask for approval if that was okay. That would be my guess. I, I personally, I was so moved and, and hurt and prayers are powerful. I mean, we, you know, you see these wrestlers all the time and, and what you and I do, we, we come in passing with them, but I just praying for him every day. It's, it's so emotional, Sam. Yeah. And I just, and I know this is also, I mean, this is a cause that's near and dear to your heart. I've worked eight years in pediatric cancer specifically and right. I just worked with so many families and kids. And thank you for saying that I work closely with a foundation called the Bat Cole Foundation, which is just my true passion and technology and, and just as a human being. But it's to me, this, it, this was just it was too much. And I, 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 I can't say it any more eloquently because it's such a such a heavy topic. But I yeah. was, I'm sure they probably were like, Roman, do you want this to be a part of the storyline? And sure, I don't know. But to me, it was just, it was too intense. Right. And I get that. That's kind of what I expected you to say, especially because, like you just said, this has been something that has been near and dear to you for a long time. And seeing it affect somebody that you watch week in, week out and have an admiration for is like crushing, exactly like you said. But I I have to believe that Roman Reigns was well aware of this. And, you know, I think Roman Reigns is a show must go on type of guy. So I, I think that if you've got, to me, I, I believe that Roman Reigns must have, on some level, must approve of this on some level. I would believe he does, especially because it's Seth and Dean doing it. And, you know, I think for guys like Roman, sometimes if there's something so horrible that happens to you, you go, well, you know what, if something this bad happens to me, let me try to use it for good. Let me push, put it back in to the business. Let me put my guys, Seth and Dean, let them use it to put them in the best possible position because those are my brothers. And they understand the very delicate sort of intricate levels of where can we go with this thing? You know, I think it's super important that we acknowledge that it's Seth and Dean doing this because I think if anybody knows exactly that tightrope line to walk with this thing, it's those guys. Because, you know, those tears that were coming down Seth Rollins' face were real-life tears. Like, that, that's a real-life thing that I think both those guys are feeling. Well, and let's not forget, too, not to get, like, sentimental, but WWE does an amazing job. We see it week yes. in and week out in supporting good causes. Yes. I know, I would guess, like, 99.9% I'm accurate here that they were handling it with the utmost sensitivity. So right. I'm sure that it was, it, this was all done proper. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, yeah, yeah. I'm not the most sensitive guy in the world and I love wrestling so much. I just think it's such a great story, but I totally get where you're coming from. Um, I, look, yeah. I don't think you're shocked. I don't think I'm shocked. I think we kind of knew where everybody was going to land on that one. Didn't, don't you? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to admit it, but you knew, you knew, uh, real quick now, while we still have you, number two is, uh, I don't know how closely, well, I'm sure you've been following NXT pretty closely because you were down there for the TV tapings. Um, the Gargano heel turn, I, I just, you know, I, I say the Gargano's heel turn is my number two story, but man, it, NXT is just, to me, under a new renaissance. Like, mm-hmm. you and I used to talk about NXT constantly. You know, we went on the first road trip when it was, Sasha Banks and Kevin Owens and that whole class. Um, we were there when it was uh, the, the class of Nakamura and Samoa Joe and those guys. But right now, NXT may be as good as it's ever been. I mean, the Undisputed Era, the war, the tag match between the Undisputed Era and the War Raiders a couple weeks ago was just off the charts. And it, that was just a TV match. 
every takeover is back to being like super, super, super amazing. The Gargano Champa war, the whole series of matches was among the best you could ever hope to see. I don't think anybody saw this coming where Gargano would be the one who attacked Aleister Black. I love that. And the fact that Ciampa's coming back and now saying he's proud of Gargano. The idea that, that, that Ciampa is still champion when you would have sworn that he won that title on TV. I'm sure he's just going to lose it at the pay-per-view. And he's still holding on to the thing. Um, I think NXT is running on all cylinders. I love this Gargano heel turn because I'm interested in where it's going. I can't tell you. I don't read the spoilers. And I can't. A hundred percent tell you where this is going, but NXT has built my faith up in the product so much that I believe it's going to an amazing place. Agree. And it's electric. It's interesting to, you know, I don't read a lot of the, I don't read the net stuff. I just kind of keep in my own little silo. The sheets? Yeah. As you like to call them. Yeah. Uh, But interesting hearing some of those guys say they're really appreciating their moment there. And I think that's powerful to know that you you don't you only get so much time typically in NXT, mm-hmm. and to hear that some of them just know what they have in this moment, and yeah. they want to be there a little longer. That it, to me is like that says it all. And I mean, and you know from talking to him, I'm sure in the limited, you know, whatever limited conversations you've had with him, maybe they've been lengthy conversations, but you know, in talking to the guy, like as far as wrestling goes, Triple H is a, is a genius. And, and, like, I think about that sometimes. The idea that these NXT guys and girls get one-on-one FaceTime on a regular basis with Triple H and, and get to kind of allow Triple H and Shawn Michaels and, the, and, and Matt Bloom and the guys in the, and the people, Sarah Amato, the people in the Performance Center, to guide their careers on a regular basis on some level, like, that's irreplaceable. That's priceless. I don't want to overshare, but I've been down at the Performance Center and the intimate. You and I went down there years ago, too, right? When it yeah. opened. Yeah. But the intimate environment that you're speaking of and that one on one time and the fact that just people are around, it goes back to that, like, just show up. Right. Just show up and, and work hard. It's really an incredible place. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But, yeah, so you're happy with what NXT TV looks like right now leading into war games. I think it's going through, as you said, like this whole other new cycle, this new yeah. renaissance. Yeah. Which I think I, we didn't, we, it was unclear for a moment where NXT was going. We're all like, because eh, it was so exciting when it started. I think we're back to that, that thrill of it all. 100% agree. 100% agree. Now, I know your time is limited, but can we get to the number one story? Oh, I got your time. I, I, got, I built you some extra time. One, I knew you would. You always do. Uh, <laughs> so the number one story of the week is something that, uh, With everything that's surrounding Crown Jewel and everything going on, I feel like it's not being talked about enough that this week we're looking at a moment that not only did a lot of people think was never going to happen, but the guy himself told us wasn't going to happen. And that's the fact that Shawn Michaels is coming back for another match. Like I am, I I think that this is one of the biggest wrestling stories of the year and everything else going on around uh, crown jewel has made us forget that Sean coming back is something that I don't think anybody saw coming. And, and, and certainly we asked about it. We talked about it. We, we theorized about it, but uh, you know, Sean Michaels made me look at his career very, very differently a year or two ago when I had him on the podcast and I asked him, that was when, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but that was when everybody was talking about the idea of Sean coming back and wrestling AJ Styles. For some reason, that rumor and idea was just in the air and it was permeating wrestling conversation. And so my question to him wasn't why or, or, or are you coming back? It was, are you going to wrestle AJ Styles? And if not, why don't you want to have your one more match? Like, explain to me, because you're still in great shape. You got all the fan support in the world. All this ridiculous money's on the table. Why wouldn't you want to have one more match? And Sean, and I've talked about this a million times on the podcast, but I think it bears repeating over and over again because it was one of my favorite conversations that I've had with a superstar on the podcast. He broke down how the character, the Shawn Michaels character, that started 
in the WWE as one of the Rockers. When Shawn, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, the Rockers, that character who is in the Rockers is the same character that took this journey, that threw Marty through the barbershop window, that became the sexy boy, that paired with Sherry, that became the heartbreak kid, that left Sherry, that was the Intercontinental Champion, that went to WrestleMania 10 in the ladder match, that went to WrestleMania 12 and the boyhood dream came true, that went to WrestleMania 14 and DX was hot, that left wrestling, that came back to fight Triple H in that street fight, that went on to the Elimination Chamber to become champion again, that went on in that second part of his career, to the runs with Jericho, to the runs with Hunter, to the runs with all these people, John Cena. You're leaving out Diesel. Well, yeah, the Diesel era was right. That was right, WrestleMania 11. Same guy, right? Was the same guy who was in the Rockers, was the same guy who wrestled Stone Cold, was the same guy who wrestled John Cena. It was the same character. And the, the, the Shawn Michaels that lost to The Undertaker and, and ended his career was the same Shawn Michaels that started as one of the rockers with Marty Jannetty. And this character arc over the course of a multi-decade career is like nothing else that's ever been in wrestling. And like, I sat back after he explained that to me and I went, oh my God. Because I mean, who's got an arc like that? I mean, you talk about Diesel. You know, when you look at Kevin Nash's arc, the arc of Vinny Vegas is separated from the arc of Diesel, which is separated from the arc of Kevin Nash and the NWO, right? You had, you had stops and starts, and it, it, that's not the same character. That's the same man portraying different characters. There are so few people that have this one fluid arc that tells a story from beginning to end in such a complete and, and, and wonderful way. And, you know, Sean said at the time, he didn't want to ruin that. Now, you know, he ends up as a coach in, in NXT at the Performance Center. And I think that the, the danger of doing that is the wrestling bug can get you. When you deal with the enthusiasm of the people around you, the young guys that are around you, when you start getting in the ring and working stuff out again, you know, that can creep back into your brain. And all of a sudden, oh, my God, I, I miss this. I want to do this again. Uh, couple that with the fact that you're looking at a huge payday. Couple that with the fact that you're getting to work with guys that you've been working with for all these years with Triple H and The Undertaker and Kane. Uh, I, I think it makes the decision one that is makeable. But I still find myself even more surprised that he's coming back than I am by the fact that he is completely bald. I, I, that, I, and I, I was very surprised when I saw that cue ball haircut. But I'm even more surprised that he's coming back. Where do you stand on the return to the ring of Shawn Michaels? That was really good, though, Sam. That was like a strong soliloquy. I mean, that that's was, look. That's all. That's all the heartbreak wow. kid. I can't take credit for that. that I'm the last strong. professional Reach broadcaster, right but I had, I had, I had great. Uh, and then, and then it know. was so well put. And then you end with him being like his hair. Did you see he's bald? That's crazy. He's the heartbreak kid. He shaved it off, man. Cut him some slack. I had no idea, though. I, I've never... I, it was a surprise. I mean, come on. Shawn right. Michaels' hair is like as iconic as his, as, as his moveset. I mean... Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I've never seen a super kick get thrown with, with a cue ball haircut. And he's going to end up losing the headband at some point in that match. So we're going to see bald Shawn Michaels. I'm interested in it. I'm all for it. You know, I was shocked when Triple H went bald. But he looks amazing. Bald is beautiful. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying it was a shock. Fair. And <laughs> I ask you back uh, after that whole, you know, strong recap. Wonder why he didn't come back for Greatest Royal Rumble, which was interesting to see that he was thrown literally, quote, boatloads hmm. of cash to make that return there, which wasn't that far off. Do you hmm. think it was a matter of being re like, why now? I think why this event? I think that it was, it's probably because he spent more time in NXT, so like he's maybe caught that bug a little bit more, and you've had time to build a story that brings him back, you know? The promo that he did with The Undertaker leading to the Australia show, where it was Undertaker versus Triple H, like that promo itself made people hungry oh. for a Shawn Michaels return. So that promo went down, what, in September? So now you've got... You know, almost a two-month build towards this thing where you've actually gotten to tell a story that's not just he's coming back now. 
there's a story behind him coming back. Now, for me, this tag match, it's like if Shawn Michaels is coming back for one more match, this is not the match, right? Like, you you don't want to be like, okay, there's this amazing story with Shawn Michaels from beginning to end, and then also this one tag match. Like, you hope that this is not one more match, because I think the only way to do this is the most effectively so that it maintains the beautiful art that is the career of Shawn Michaels. And by the way, retires the Undertaker at WrestleMania. I don't even maybe it's I'm I'd be okay with it, but I don't even need to see that. I want to see Shawn Michaels versus Tommaso Ciampa. I want to see you know Shawn Michaels versus Adam Cole. I want to see I want to see that. I want to see really. I want to see one of these young guys. Bury Shawn Michaels' career forever. Like, you want to turn Chima- Tommaso Ciampa into the ultimate bad guy? Let him be the one that ends Shawn Michaels' career. You know, give it you to one— You and I have always seen differently on this, because you always want the the legend to put somebody else over. I want the arc culminated. I want to come full circle on the career. So you want, like, Shawn Michaels ends The Undertaker's career, and then we can all applaud— the heartbreak kid and go like you did it, I like buddy. The, I like the I like the fairy tale ending. Yeah, but what about sex. what about the Undertaker's ending then? The Undertaker has to go out. The Undertaker's retired a hundred times. That's the other problem I have here with this retirement thing. It's retirement for now. Right, Sean was the one person. And this is across the industry. This is music. This is celebrities. This is I'm never gonna make another film. I'm never gonna wrestle another match. Don't say you're gonna retire if it's just retirement. For now, and you know I love Shawn Michaels. Of course, I'll, I'll watch him for, for decades to come. But, but Kate, you know what this is, Katie. It's like what we do. Whenever you do anything that's performance based, like you get worn out by it, you get finished. Okay, like I've just it's 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 like it tears your soul out, and you go, I can't keep doing this. I'm done. I made my money. I figured it out. I accomplished all my goals. I'm done. And then you walk away, and you go, you know what was really fun when I was doing that thing that I just left. That was a good time. Everybody, like, if I left, like, uh, broadcasting, I'm sure I'd be like, I know, I'm so tired of talking about everything. I just got to go every day and talk about everything. All I want to do is not have an opinion about anything. Just leave me alone. And then a week later, I'd go, I wish somebody wanted to hear me talk right now. I, 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 wish, I wish somebody wanted my take on something. And you want to you wanna keep doing it, especially if you're Shawn Michaels level good at something. It's like, why waste it? I know you thought you were done, but that you, you thought you were done twice already. Like, you're not done. So you just automatically build in the comeback tour when you retire. Look, you know. That's you, what's TBD. I think you just got to do it. The only person who's done it is Stone Cold. Stone Cold left with no farewell tour and never came back. And I don't think he's ever going to come back. You know, Stone Cold is the only person that's ever done it. No farewell to her. Not even in a, his match wasn't announced as his last match. Nothing. He lost to The Rock. He went home and he never had another match <laughs> again. That's why Stone Cold is the greatest of all time. But it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's amazing. It's it never happens. Now he's just fighting flies on his podcast and stuff like that. He's amazing at everything he does. But you know, yeah, I, I, I I'm. I'm okay with this Shawn Michaels return if we turn it into another sort of final chapter in his story, not just what we're seeing here. I don't want one more match. I want one more run. And it only has to lead to WrestleMania. I'm not talking about another six-year run. I'm talking about, like, you know, two or three matches, something big at the end, and then we're out. Does that make sense? Undeniably, I think he looks good. I mean, I just like great. him as a person too. I, I think you you said it so well in that that story arc, and it actually made me reflect that how many just how much he's done over his career span is incredible. But I also just think him as a person over the years is, you know, I love me the faith guys. Oh, yeah. So I, I I'm just I'm behind anything Shawn Michaels does for as long as we can get him. Look, Godspeed. a guy that's got Jesus and might also be the greatest wrestler of all time, it's tough to hate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who could you do it? That's like, I don't know what it is about these guys. AJ Styles, he's got Jesus, one yep. of the greatest of all time. It's amazing. Maybe they're on to something. Right. Maybe they're on to like something. We like to say, if God is on my side, who could be against us? Okay? Right. Right. You're right. <laughs> You're right. 
That's why you're such a big Million Dollar Man fan. Yeah. Right? Remember when we ran into him at the hotel? And you started having panic attack? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's all true. Well, Katie Linendahl, uh, uh, it has been a joy uh, catching up with you. We have to do this far more often. Yes, absolutely. Like, uh, <laughs> like on a regular basis again. Um, do you have uh, where? Where do you want to send the folks to? Oh, please uh, follow me on social. I always post some fun stuff. Yes. I am on Twitter and Instagram at Katie Linendahl, and uh, you know, Sam, stay tuned on the on the wrestling side too. There's always something going on. By the way, like, and this is little Easter eggs for everybody. We all know. <laughs> That you did that Nakamura video a while back? Yes. And I love the little... I don't know if you and I have talked about it, but I'm aware. I'm ve- Trust me, I'm aware of the uh, of the Easter eggs that snuck out of that music video and have snuck on to... Uh... <laughs> Can we talk about that real quick? Of course. Yeah, so my gal pal went heel on me. So we did this awesome <laughs> Nakamura video. Right. It went nuts on YouTube. Where right. We did like our own rendition of his entrance song for anybody that hasn't seen it. Mm-hmm. And... My gal pal, Emmy, who is from Japan, mm-hmm. she went heel on me, <laughs> and she's in the new video, the new Nakamura video. I swear yep. to God, because I know, I mean, and I, I, I it, Emmy is connected to me through you yes. and then through our other friend. And, like, so, so uh, you know, I know Emmy. And, like, I'm watching this Nakamura video, <laughs> and, like, it took me probably a month before it really clicked in. And I see, like, all the tattoos on Emmy's arm as she yes. takes out her violin. And I go... She's just smoking too. I mean, that girl she's is amazing. talented, smoking, amazing. And I go, I go, wait, wait a minute. And, and that's when the that's when the rewind <laughs> play, rewind play. And I sent it to our mutual friend Troy. I'm like, Troy, who is this? And he goes, Oh my God, is that what's Emmy doing there? I like. Well, I, can I give you another Easter egg too? I think I know it, but but give it to the people. Okay, so in that music video. It was myself, Emmy, and my friend who's an opera singer, and your friend too, yes. Marcy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I She's remember. a professional yeah. opera singer, but she also does aerial. Right. She, if you might listen to, uh, sometimes it's it's it hasn't been on for a while, but Aid in English has a little opera entrance that was used for a hot second. Yeah. That might be uh that might be Marcy's little voice behind that. Pre Rusev day, Aid in English. Yes, exactly. Yes. I haven't seen, it's it's been a hot second, but it was cool to hear. I I literally was like multitasking, watching. You know, I have a hundred and fifty inch screen where I watch wrestling, and I heard it come on while I was multitasking. I was like, I know that voice. Well, you are it, you are WWE's music department's developmental territory. <laughs> like, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're looking to get into the music department of WWE, <laughs> I would say try to come up with a project with Linendahl because clearly. <laughs> It's the fast track. That is really funny. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we're musically uh musically inclined over here, so love it. Hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Well, thank you, Katie, and we'll talk again soon. Oh, thank you so much, Sam. Miss you. Good yeah. to chat. Yeah, for sure. And we will see you next week here on Not Sam Wrestling. Chowski. Thanks for listening. Follow at Not Sam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe. This has been Not Sam Wrestling. Not Sam Wrestling.